Ah, here we are again. Today I want to look at the privatisation and corporatisation of publicly funded research and how publicly funded research has now become the mechanism via which privately owned corporations are able to uh, apply for and win patents on innovations in all fields of human endeavour which originally were developed in the public sector. You see, things have changed dramatically in universities over the last three decades. The introduction of hex debts is not the only issue. The other issue is the superhighway that has been developed into this country's public institutions research laboratories. And this has occurred for a variety of reasons and one of the major reasons was inadequate funding of public universities by the government giving universities the green light to enter into partnerships with private corporations. And this is a little bit like drawing up a contract with the devil. You can't expect the devil to honour the terms of the contract and you can't expect privately owned corporations to honour the terms of a contract with a public institution because what happens is that these public institutions then become financially dependent on these partnerships and once they become financially dependent on these partnerships we see the private sector placing more and more constraints on the type of research uh, which, is, which evolves the type of research which is developed and we've now got to the ridiculous situation where when private corporations enter into partnerships with publicly owned universities they actually determine not only the nature of the research but if the researcher finds negative findings as far as that particular corporation's product is concerned or the product it is financing is concerned they are not allowed to publish I mean that's the basis of science the basis of science and human knowledge is the ability for researchers to publish in peer-reviewed journals, whether these journals are digital or whether they are non-digital. This is what allows the rest of the world to look at a particular field of research and see whether that particular group has analysed things in the manner in which they should be analysed and whether the results which uh, they came up with stand up to scrutiny. Now if we find that privately owned corporations can determine what is published and what isn't published, what that means is that the only things that ever get published are research results which augment their bottom line. Anything which draws a criticism never reaches the light of day. So we now have a huge issue in terms of research, whether it's medical, whether it's engineering, whether it's artificial intelligence, whether it's historical. Because if a field of research 
has the ability to be profitable because the government is not willing to bankroll that field of research corporations who are looking for the next big thing to augment their profits enter into partnerships with publicly owned institutions and the these publicly owned institutions then enter into partnerships with the private corporations not only regarding the development of what's been discovered but what actually is going to be discovered and how it's presented. Theoretically, knowledge should be shared. And that's the whole purpose of peer-reviewed publication. It allows knowledge to be shared because very few people make extraordinary di discoveries. Knowledge is built up atom by atom by atom, research paper by research paper by research paper. And each new innovation stands on the back of previous innovations. And to allow privately owned corporations to be able to take a patent on this work means that although the public has funded or partially funded this work and provided the institutional base and the laboratories and the research staff which are paid to a significant degree by that publicly funded university it's the private sector which takes away the prize it wins first prize over and over and over again so we have a crisis in universities, a crisis in terms of what is researched, what isn't researched, what is developed, what isn't developed. And this crisis is not just a crisis of funding, it's a crisis of the way universities are now structured. The fact is that very few staff now have tenure. Tenure is exceptionally important as far as independence is concerned. If you have no tenure and only a fixed term contract which may last two or three years, you may find at the end of that fixed term contract that you won't get a job, not just in that university, but in any other university around the world. Because you may have shown up research, you may have been able to develop research which highlights the neg negative aspects of new medications or new technology or new building techniques. So we now not only have the university entering into these private-public partnerships of the private sector, which in most regards um, help the pro uh, private sector to maximise their profits, we now have an itiner itinerant workforce, an itiner itinerant research workforce, which moves from research project to research project, who have no tenure, who have no ability to speak out, and if they speak out, they know they won't be employed by that university or another university and more importantly they know that if they are marked as a somebody who doesn't um, follow to the letter the contract which they've signed that they will be blacklisted from every research facility in every university in most parts of the world. And this is a huge issue because it destroys innovation. And what it does, it focuses research on areas which create, which are able to create profits. I mean, malaria research has been lagging for a long time, although over 2 million children die from malaria every year. 
and tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions, have to deal with the chronic problem of having recurrent malaria. But the type of money that's gone into that research has been minimal. Has uh, other areas of medicine where a vaccination, which is only used once or twice, may prevent that disease. In comparison to funding research which, which uh, makes medications which are used on a daily basis exceptionally important. Because if you create a new medication which tens of millions if not hundreds of millions of people are using on a daily basis and you have a patent for 25 years as far as that medication is concerned which you developed through subverting public universities and public research then you're on a winner and your share price will skyrocket and your shareholders will be the major beneficiaries because when you hold that 25 year patent the type of price that you can ask for that particular medication or drug knows no boundaries because there is no competition available for 25 years because of the patent. And the dilemma with patents is today, it's not something new, but we are now seeing patents being issued for so-called discoveries which have existed in the natural world for hundreds of thousands of years. So universities are now hostages and because universities are the centres which have the facilities, the time, the resources and the people to pursue to a rapidly growing privately owned corporate sector which now dominates many aspects of a university education. Now, when COVID-19 was first uh, discovered, the Chinese government and their researchers released the DNA ge genotype so that scientists around the world could actually save time in terms of developing vaccinations which would be able to deal with COVID-19, not in terms of eradicating it, but in terms of decreasing its virulence so that we could, as a population, whether we were vaccinated or not, develop an immunity. The type of immunity which only, only developed in the past when 10, 20, 30, 40 percent of the population died as we saw during the Black Plague in Asia Minor, Europe and China in the 1600s. So the issue is today, who owns what? in terms of development which are necessary in order to deal with emergencies, whether they're scientific emergencies or medical emergencies or housing emergencies. Who owns that technology? And why should a privately owned corporation, many listed on the world stock markets, who are dominated by a small number of shareholders, why should they be able to hold a population of over 8 billion to ransom for a quarter of a century? We saw the tens of thousands that died when a a, um, when a cure, in inverted commas, was developed 
for AIDS, HIV. I mean, it can't eradicate it, but at least it can keep the symptoms under control. And the tens of thousands that died, especially in South Africa, where the AIDS epidemic became a national issue because of the number of orphans which were being cared for by the state and elderly grandparents. So it's a real issue. But today, there's no debate. There's no debate about who owns scientific knowledge. There's no debate about what should happen when there are private-public partnerships in terms of scientific knowledge. There's no public debate about the share of profits which should go back to those public institutions, not just the research team which developed that particular innovation. There's no debate about how the state is recompensed for funding all that basic research which led to that particular issue. So we have a crisis. It's a crisis of morality. It's an ethical crisis. And these are the type of crisis we deal with over and over again. As we see private corporations move into the public sphere and provide services and goods and medication which are normally provided by the public sector. And every one of these confrontations there are losers. And those losers are those people who cannot afford that particular medication or as we see through the pharmaceutical benefits scheme we see corporations charging extraordinary amounts over $1,200 for 40 capsules to treat COVID-19 which is subsidised by the taxpayer. So either people do without or in a, in a society like Australia where there is a pharmaceutical benefit scheme and a national insurance scheme and a national disability insurance scheme, the taxpayer is asked to foot the bill for corporate greed. And in many regards, we find ourselves in this situation because we have privatised institutions which in the past have not only been able to develop medical innovations or scientific innovations but have been able to provide those innovations at cost price to the community because that knowledge is public knowledge, knowledge which has not been patent. Patent laws are theft. People say property is theft. Property in comparison to patent laws, the issue there is insignificant. Patent laws are theft because patent laws allow corporations which have the financial resources to promote particular fields of human endeavour which maximise their profits at the expense of public finances and the public at large, especially the public in poorer nation states which are not able to afford the extraordinary amounts of money which they demand to provide necessary treatment. Think about it. Next time if you're on a medication or a scriptable medication, look at the bottle. You may have paid $20 or $30 or $16 or whatever, but if that drug is patent, the taxpayer may be paying 
$200 or $1,200 for 40 COVID-19 tablets. That's right. We're asked to foot the bill. Although we provided the infrastructure, the universities and the research facilities and in many cases the researchers which were able to create the scientific foundations which are then used by the private sector to develop innovations to suit their major shareholders. Think about it. Science is not value three. Although research can be value three, it is not value three when it is dominated by a small number of corporations.